thank you for accepting our invitation. 35th Commander of the United States Pacific Fleet, Admiral Scott Swift. Well, thank you for uh, for joining us here this afternoon and and sharing this uh, this time together. Uh, I very much look forward to this opportunity to uh, return to Japan and uh, reacquaint myself with uh, the many friends that I, I left behind when I uh, when I departed as the uh, as a Seventh Fleet Commander. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, Admiral Kwano, Admiral Takei, and uh, the Minister of Defense for uh, such a warm welcome uh, that I've uh, received here. Uh, in many ways, uh, things are very much the same as I uh, drive the streets of uh, Tokyo and, and visit the, uh, the leadership here. Uh, but I'm also mindful uh, that things change uh, quickly uh, here in the, uh, in the theater. And this has been a great opportunity for uh, me to get reacquainted uh, face to face uh, with those that uh, provide such important leadership uh, here uh, in Japan. And, uh, and in the region uh, as well. Uh, I'm very honored to be uh, selected as the uh, Pacific Fleet Commander. Um, I'm just into uh, about my sixth week of, uh, of command. Uh, and I was very excited uh, when selected and even more excited now uh, that I've uh, commenced my first trip uh, into my area of uh, responsibility and it's been a, a great trip uh, so far. Um, tomorrow I travel to uh, Yokosuka. Uh, this will my first, uh, be my first opportunity to engage face-to-face uh, -face with the sailors of uh, Pacific Fleet, those stationed there in Yokosuka. I look for, uh, very much forward to that opportunity as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd be uh, interested in taking any questions that, uh, that you may have. Our explaining the stars and stripes. Uh, we all saw your photos up in the PA, very mm -hmm. nice. And um, we've also seen just a lot more focus. Uh, we've seen you know, the Fort Worth with photos of the Chinese uh, BDG behind it, uh, the Spratleys. In the last few months, it seems like I've seen the Navy put out more about its presence in the South China Sea, whereas in previous years, it was a little more uh, under the wraps. Was there ever a strategic decision made where the Navy went and said, hey, we want to really show people that, that we're out here at, to, to send a message in the region? The, um, not from my uh, perspective, uh, and certainly those uh, uh, opportunities to communicate uh, what we're doing out and about uh, in the theater uh, are decisions that uh, flow through my headquarters. Uh, but I think it's important to note, uh, and it's been reinforced as I've uh, returned to the uh, Pacific, uh, as I said just uh, six months ago, um, uh, that there's many in the region that are, that are concerned about uh, uh, the uncertainty of the future, and, and uh, many of them describe uh, uh, the various uh, situations that uh, exist that uh, lead to increased uh, stability or potentially lead to increased uh, stability. Uh, so certainly in my tenure as the 7th Fleet Commander, uh, we conducted uh, operations such as you suggest. I assume you're referring to the Lassen uh, article as well as to the article uh, with respect to Fort Worth. Uh, so these are common and we have certainly conducted uh, operations exactly uh, such as this uh, throughout my tenure as 7th Fleet. They've continued uh, under the tenure of uh, Vice Admiral Thomas as well, uh, and I'm sure they'll continue into the future. And in fact, it's reflected on the visits of uh, Secretary Carter, uh, who spoke about the importance of uh, demonstrating freedom of navigation uh, to the region, and, and certainly uh, from a, a U.S. perspective as well. Uh, so uh, if there's been an uptick in, uh, in those communications, uh, articles and whatnot, it's, I, I don't know that um, it's reflective of a strategy other than the fact that we uh, want to reassure those in the region uh, who ask to be reassured uh, about uh, U.S. presence and the fact that it will be sustained here. Well, I'm Kirk Spencer with USA Today. Talk about China, please. What do you think about China? What do you, you know, how concerned are you about the, the 
I would build a campaign, or you think they're getting more aggressive, more assertive? Just tell us what you think about what China's doing there. The uh, first one I would say is that uh, it's important to keep uh, uh, things in context. Uh, so uh, the first thing that we seek is a positive uh, relationship with China. And I think there's uh, clear examples of the progress that are being uh, made there. And sometimes this gets uh, lost in the immediacy of events as they unfold day to day. But it, it really is a, uh, a long-term commitment of the United States. Pacific Fleet was formed in 1907. Uh, there's a data point that oftentimes is lost on people. We've been around here for a long time. Uh, but as far as the uh, specifics of a positive relationship, I would point to uh, the, the relationship between Emma Greener and Emma Wu. Uh, they've met several times, uh, both in the United States uh, and, in, uh, and in China. And I think the uh, benefits of that close relationship and relationships like that are reflective in uh, the successful uh, implementation of cues, the uh, code for uh, 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 unalerted uh, encounters at sea. Um, and that's been quite successful. In fact, it's been adopted uh, by many navies around the region. That increases transparency, it increases the opportunity to communicate, it increase, increases the opportunity to uh, understand uh, intentions. Uh, that's another uh, positive example. Uh, my deputy uh, at Pacific Fleet uh, participates in a mill-to-mill -mill dialogue on a regular basis, uh, both back in Washington, uh, in Hawaii, uh, and in China. Uh, I think those are positive developments. I think China's participation in RIMPAC, uh, the last RIMPAC, is another uh, uh, positive indication. I think the angst that I sense uh, in the region and that friends uh, share with me uh, comes from the lack of transparency, so I think uh, transparency is uh, very important to pursue. Um, that's why I like to hold forums such as this to offer an opportunity to uh, answer questions. Uh, one of the reasons that I visit the countries in the region is to exchange ideas, uh, deepen my understanding of the concerns of the countries in the region. Um, but we very much uh, pursue a, uh, a positive relationship with China. We have much more in common than uh, we do in competition. The vast majority of the exchanges uh, between uh, Seventh Fleet unit, Third Fleet units, uh, and the PLAN units is very positive, conversational uh, in nature. Um, there is the, uh, uh, the exchanges, there are the exchanges that occur as you saw in the in the uh, CNN report of the PA flight that occur from, uh, from time to time, uh, but this is the exception, uh, not the rule. Uh, the PA flight that I participated in, it was a, a routine operational flight that wasn't something that was, uh, that was special. Uh, the P-8 is uh, uh, fairly new to the Navy. I haven't had the opportunity to uh, observe uh, it in operation. I welcome the opportunity to uh, to spend that time flying, uh, flying in the airplane. But even that in of itself was routine, and I would describe the flight uh, in execution as being routine. They didn't tell you to go away, go away, like they did with the CNN flight. This is in, this is Chinese territory. Go away. The um, we've heard those reports uh, before. I don't want to talk about the uh, specifics of the flight itself since it was an operational uh, flight. Um, I think the fact that those transmissions uh, are being made. Uh, not just uh, to, uh, with respect to U.S. operations, but uh, other operations in the theater as well, uh, causes concern and uncertainty about exactly what intent is, and intent is very important. Um, but I think the first step to get to that intent is a positive dialogue, uh, which is why we seek a uh, positive relationship with China, a deeper understanding. I think other from Uh You're here in Japan. Uh, security legislation talks with the Parliament. So I went through the law house last week. Um, barring you know, any major um, difficulties, it's going to become law after 60 days, 60 day rule. The <coughs> when this comes into effect, what are the on an operational basis, on a kind of a, on the ground or a, a the sea basis, what are the things you would expect the Japanese to do that they're not doing now? What are the things that you would want them to do? Stabilize, stabilize 
provision of that in more secure. What are, what are the things that you're look, looking forward to the Japanese self-defined process to contribute? Uh, the, the core of the question is really a question for the Japanese government. Uh, I will say that uh, I think that the effect, if it were to pass into law, uh, the effect on uh, the Pacific Fleet's relationship uh, with the Japanese Maritime Defense Force uh, will be evolutionary, not revolutionary as a result. Uh, we already have a very deep uh, relationship, long historical relationship, uh, between uh, the U.S. military and the self-defense force in general. But I think in particular between our, our maritime forces. Uh, but if this legislation is to pass, it will create an opportunity for us to deepen that relationship. The mechanisms uh, by which the relationship would deepen are already in place. Uh, so the Japanese Maritime Defense Force already participates with us in exercises such as uh, Pacific Partnership, uh, which is a challenge for, for many uh, navies to support. Uh, it brings in elements of command and control, it brings in elements of uh, logistics, it brings in uh, uh, elements of uh, engaging uh, through multiple domains, the sea and the shore domain. Uh, there's a, a very strong support of non-governmental uh, organizations, so there's policy issues that uh, uh, we need to uh, deal with. We have a robust uh, multilateral uh, exercise program. You may know that uh, we'll be conducting Malabar uh, in the Bay of Bengal soon, which will include U.S. forces, Indian forces, and GMSDF forces. So I think were this legislation, uh, legislation to pass, I think it will provide the opportunity to deepen the relationship in an evolutionary type way more than a, a revolutionary uh, type way. I'm excited about the opportunity that such passage would present, um, but again I defer to the Japanese government and the Japanese people to uh, determine exactly what it would mean in execution. And could I just uh, ask you, you just come from South Korea, um, one of the kind of issues Have you been to South Korea and you come to Japan? Are you in any of the meetings you're having? Are you trying to encourage Japan and South Korea to come closer together? Uh, from a maritime perspective, I think uh, we've seen that uh, already. I, I uh, go back to my comment earlier about uh, uh, the Rim of Pacific exercise and the collaboration that uh, we saw there uh, with all the countries, which included both Korea uh, and in uh, Japan. Uh, there's common interests and there's common concerns that I think are shared with uh, both the Japanese people and the Korean people, and there's an opportunity, certainly in the maritime domain, uh, to collaborate. Uh, I think it's been made clear by uh, certainly uh, Ambassador uh, Lippert and Ambassador Kennedy um, that such a development uh, would be uh, positive in the view of uh, the American government. Certainly it would be supportive of my efforts in here. I have a close relationship uh, with both the Koreans and the Japanese, and we have operated uh, together uh, from time to time. So I think that would be a, a positive development, but this is clearly something to be discussed uh, between the Korean government and the Japanese government. I think there was a question. point is, uh, is not a concern uh, of mine uh, that uh, this, this might lead to war of some kind. Um, I think the relationship that we've enjoyed uh, with the Japanese uh, along with many others in the region actually has uh, resulted in the 70 years of stability 
that we've enjoyed since World War II. Uh, and I think that the efforts, that uh, uh, the legislative efforts, are efforts to continue uh, uh, that piece. I think it's also, the second point I would make is uh, not in my role as the commander of Pacific Fleet, but I think it's a, a process that's normal to me as an American. I mean, we see these dialogues within our own uh, government on a regular basis, and there's an opportunity for uh, American voters to speak, and uh, I think it's reflective of uh, a strong governance. Um, so I think it's an example um, uh, uh, from which to draw from. Uh, and as far as what it, it might become, again, I, this is something for the Japanese people to, uh, uh, to, to determine. I will tell you that, uh, just as one example, the support uh, that we were able to provide to the uh, Japanese Self-Defense Force uh, following the Great Eastern Earthquake, uh, we called it Operation uh, Tomodachi. Uh, there are still service members today that get into a taxi cab in Tokyo or Yokohama or Yokosuka or Sasebo or Sawa, wherever we may be out and about uh, in Japan, and they're thanked for the support that they uh, provided, that uh, U.S. forces provided uh, through the self-defense force to the Japanese people. Uh, so uh, Americans are warmly welcome uh, wherever they travel, military uh, members in particular, wherever we travel through uh, Japan. So I haven't seen any negative implications at all in uh, in the relationships that uh, we've enjoyed uh, with our Japanese hosts. Yes? Uh, MC Sue Brooks with the uh, American Forces Network. Uh, as you settle, settled into your new position, uh, can you kind of give us a uh, status of the uh, Pacific Fleet uh, as it stands right now? The, uh, I made a comment uh, recently. Uh, I'm struck as I uh, travel uh, through, the, uh, through the region at uh, the number of times I'm asked about uh, U.S. Navy presence and, and can we increase it, and it, uh, it struck me. I answered the, the uh, question that was uh, uh, asked of me recently in this way, that my, my sense was if the entire United States Navy was uh, present in the waters around Japan, the question would be the same, can you bring more? Uh, the only Navy that's more powerful than the Pacific Fleet is the United States Navy. I think sometimes it's lost on uh, the public uh, that the Pacific Fleet is made up of the combined power of 7th Fleet and 3rd Fleet. Um, there's not very many navies that are more powerful than just 7th Fleet uh, by any metric, whether you talk about uh, capacity or, uh, or capability. Uh, but too often times when we talk about the refocus in the Pacific, uh, we focus on the numbers, the ship count or the aircraft count. Um, the power is the commitment, and it's just not a military commitment, it's an economic commitment, it's a whole of government commitment. But clearly the military uh, power commitment is the one that is most visible. Uh, having said that, the great power of Pacific Fleet is made up of sailors such as you, those that have committed to serve the nation, and the nation's focus through the president is to ensure the stability of this region. And that's a mission and a task that has been made clear to me and an expectation that we will uh, continue our efforts to engage through our partners and allies and, and friends in the region in a multilateral way uh, to ensure that that stability uh, continues. And I'm very encouraged by that. The health of the fleet is very strong. As I mentioned, tomorrow I'll travel to Yokosuka and, and have an opportunity uh, to speak directly with, uh, with sailors. And in my travels uh, around the fleet uh, so far, uh, my sense of that strength of commitment, uh, the strength of the, of the force uh, within the ships, within the aircraft, within its people, um, is uh, stronger today than it was even when I left as a 7th Fleet Commander. Uh, let me go back to the uh, South China Sea. My name is Kaoshima from NHK. Uh, I think that uh, China, last, I think last, last month, the Chinese government said that it has completed the land, uh, land reclamation for the, for the artificial island in South China Sea. And do you, uh, does U.S. Navy, uh, is it possible for you to confirm that land, uh, land island building in South China Sea uh, done by the Chinese government has been completed? 
The, um, well, it's very difficult uh, to say. I think in the public forums that you see uh, with commercial satellites, uh, there is still quite a bit of activity. And in fact, China has said that uh, while the dredging may have ceased, uh, the actual building process uh, on the artificial uh, islands uh, will continue. Uh, but more important uh, to your question is the fact that uh, uh, despite what we can observe directly, we can't predict what intent is. That's why it's so important to uh, continue to deepen our relationship. You know, that's why we see a, a positive relationship uh, with China to better understand uh, what the intent is. I mentioned the efforts of, uh, of Admiral Greenert and Admiral Wu to deepen their relationship. I mentioned the, the, the uh, RIMPAC and some of the other exercises that we uh, participated in. Uh, Admiral Greenert uh, invited me to escort Admiral Wu in a tour uh, that he made of our surface warfare school uh, up in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, I found uh, Admiral Wu to be very well informed. I found him to be very gracious and warm. Uh, he struck me as uh, any other sailor that I've had the, the benefit of uh, interacting with. Uh, so I'm very hopeful uh, about the future. We have much more in collaboration uh, with uh, all navies in the region, including the, the uh, Chinese Navy, uh, than we do in competition. Uh, the challenge is those areas of competition and friction are heightened through the lack of transparency, which is why it's so important that we all work together in a multilateral way to deepen those relationships. Uh, let me ask you one more question uh, regarding the uh, South China Sea. And, uh, I think the uh, U.S. government has confirmed that the uh, archery has been uh, deployed uh, in, the, in the New Zealand island in South China Sea. And uh, have you ever, s ha has U.S. Navy seen any other weapons or uh, military sites that has been uh, building, uh, building or deployed in the New Island? From, uh, from a Navy perspective, uh, I would say that our, our operations have been consistent and uh, we've seen uh, typical uh, maritime operations on, on behalf of both the Chinese Coast Guard and, and, the, uh, and the Chinese Navy. Uh, but I would call your attention to statements that have been made by the Chinese themselves uh, that their intent in developing the islands is to include what uh, they refer to as uh, necessary uh, military enhancements uh, based on their view of uh, their claims in the South China Sea. So uh, whether we've seen that today, I think, is less material. Um, it is clearly the intent of the Chinese to militarize, uh, militarize those, uh, those islands. What would you do if they declared a 12-mile nautical zone around the reef? I think uh, it's been clear. It's a policy question, but I think uh, policy leaders in the, uh, uh, in the United States have made clear that um, where there are disputed claims, we don't take a position, but we will continue to, uh, to exercise uh, the rights of the United States and any nation to conduct operations in international waters, and I would expect that uh, we would continue to do that. Uh, so I don't see much change in how uh, I conducted operations as a Seventh Fleet Commander and how we will conduct uh, operations in the future in my perspective as the Pacific Fleet Commander. So you would, you would ignore I think from a U.S. policy perspective, it's, uh, the United States has made clear uh, what the, the uh, governing elements of international law was, and we would continue to conform with those governing elements of international law. The, um, unfortunately, I, I, I knew it was going to be published, but I haven't read it yet, uh, so I can't uh, talk specifically uh, about what it says. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, I seem to be in a theme of transparency here. I applaud the efforts uh, because it's an effort, I think, uh, on the part of the Japanese government to be as transparent as possible. 
and to describe the situation in the region that they see as they see it and what its implications are uh, to uh, Japan and uh, how it informs uh, the actions of, uh, of the Japanese going forward. Mm. I look forward to reading it in detail. Yes. Um, regarding uh, Subic Bay for a moment, uh, the Philippines just announced that they were going to be putting some military assets there for the first time uh, in a very long time. Uh, is the U.S. interested in rotating assets into Subic Bay, assuming the EDCA uh, continues to, to go ahead? Um, again, this is a question for the, uh, the Philippine government. I wouldn't want to presuppose any decision that they, uh, they may make. Um, we have continued to make a number of visits uh, to Subic Bay. Uh, there's some uh, very... Uh, excellent uh, maintenance facilities there that we have taken advantage of to maintain the, the fleet. Uh, and I, we will continue to do that regardless of uh, what uh, national decisions the Philippines might make as far as uh, basing either, uh, I've heard discussions in the media about naval vessels and uh, potentially uh, some of the aircraft that they bought from Korea uh, may be based there. I think it's very important to stress uh, that uh, the places, uh, not bases approach it is not just a catchphrase. Uh, it makes no sense to me as the Pacific uh, commander to seek additional bases uh, in the region. It's, it, it's not necessary. Um, it doesn't uh, provide any advantage or uh, efficiency or effectiveness in, in Pacific Fleet uh, operations. Uh, we're very grateful for the support that we've enjoyed from the Philippine government in sustaining the fleet, uh, utilizing their uh, commercial capacity at, uh, at Subic Bay, uh, but it's entirely up to the Philippine uh, government as to uh, where our, our military uh, rotational uh, forces may rotate through. It, it's reasonable to expect that wherever the Philippine bases are going to be, that, that they would be the same places that we would rotate through from a, an exercise uh, perspective. We just finished an exercise, a care of exercise, down at Palawan with, uh, with Fort Worth, as an example. There's a, a, there's a, a presence of uh, Philippine Navy down there, which is why uh, that location is chosen for that, uh, that exercise. Yes? Uh, I'm Sumitai from Asset Shinder. Uh, uh, relating to the restoration of security bills, uh, some Japanese, including me, are concerning uh, the U.S. non-ratification of uh, Antos. And uh, <coughs> it seems quite uh, political rather than the, uh, the actual uh, benefits. And some conservative Congress members insist that uh, that treaty would restrict the military activities. And it's quite hard for us to understand the actual situation in the States. So, Please let us know the, uh, your, your and the actual situation about the, that issue. So, uh, as I said uh, before when I was talking about the power of uh, Pacific Fleet, uh, it's, it's quite extensive, uh, uh, but I can't uh, ratify treaties. <laughs> so, uh, I will say that uh, it's been the United States Navy policy that we would uh, conduct ourselves in accordance uh, with the mandates and the policies that are contained within UNCLOS. Uh, so from a Navy perspective, uh, we conduct operations guided uh, by, uh, by UNCLOS. Um, as we've talked here already about the challenges of uh, uh, legislative matters in front of the Diet, uh, Prime Minister Abe's effort uh, to, uh, uh, to pass laws. Uh, we have the same challenges in the United States. I must admit, as an American, sometimes I'm as confused by our political system as, uh, as anyone else may be looking from, uh, from the outside. Uh, but as I say, the, the Navy is, uh, uh, comports itself, aligns itself. Uh, with the mandates of UNCLOS as we conduct operations around the world. It goes back to the question of uh, w what might happen um, if uh, the artificial islands in the South China Sea are militarized. Um, I, I think it, 
that won't have any effect on uh, the Pacific Fleet operations because um, our uh, focus is on international norm standards rules and laws, not uh, the application of those laws from uh, a given nation's uh, perspective. My name is Thomas Kashi, an economy newspaper. Okay. Uh, my question is another Chinese territorial dispute between uh, Japan and uh, Senkaku Island. Uh, how do you see that situation? How much are you concerned? Because the Chinese ships are continuously um, coming to the area. How, how can you cooperate with uh, Japanese healthy vessels regarding the issue? Um, I, th I see the uh, the issue that, that you describe as an extension of, of really um, all the issues that so many uh, in the region uh, share their concerns about uh, with me. Uh, I think there's a, uh, a direct connection uh, with the destabilizing activities on the part of some that we see in the South China Sea as well. Uh, I think it's very important that we approach uh, our understanding of those issues and pursue solutions uh, from a multilateral perspective. Uh, the United States has been clear that the use of coercion is uh, not the right approach, that, that uh, uh, might does not make right. Uh, there are mechanisms in place, tribunals, courts, uh, certainly public dialogue, uh, diplomacy, uh, that are the correct vehicles by which to uh, uh, resolve uh, these disputes. Um, I think uh, our Secretary of State has been uh, clear about what the U.S. perspective is. Uh, I know the uh, President has uh, uh, commented uh, on this as well. And in fact, it, it guides uh, the Pacific Fleet's uh, actions uh, with respect to uh, these disputes, wherever they may uh, exist. Uh, I will note that uh, today I visited with the chief of the uh, Japanese Coast Guard uh, in recognition of the important role that the Japanese Coast Guard is, is playing with this uh, issue in, uh, in particular. And very important that uh, uh, the Japanese Coast Guard and the uh, JMSDF cooperate uh, closely on all matters that uh, uh, affect the waters around Japan. And uh, as a part of uh, uh, that, that uh, maritime uh, family of interest, uh, I think there's an important role for uh, Pacific Fleet to uh, play in those relationships as well. In case of contingency, uh, is it, am I right in saying that the uh, U.S. Navy is ready to act together with the Japanese? Um, uh, it's, it's the ongoing uh, uh, question of uh, treaties that's uh, true really throughout the region, not just to Japan. Uh, my first trip, uh, because of the uh, short nature of it, was focused on three of our five treaty allies. Uh, this is really a question that uh, would be answered by uh, the U.S. government and the Japanese government in this case. Um, but as I said before, I'm very uh, pleased with the readiness of the Pacific Fleet. Uh, and again, that readiness is reflective of the power of both the Seventh and Third Fleet. And we are ready to respond as we might be called to respond by the President uh, of the United States who will make the decision about uh, what we will do or what we won't do. Yes. Admiral, you mentioned just a minute about the USS Fort Worth. And I think uh, earlier, one of your earlier media roundtables, you mentioned that you'd like to have more of the, the, um, the littoral combat ships. Are you, do you want more? Are you going to ask for more? Or? The, um, I, I think they're going to come without my uh, asking. Uh, uh, we're, uh, we're on a path to purchase uh, 52 mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, uh, frigates. Uh, and I would imagine that they will, uh, many of those will uh, come forward to the uh, Pacific to support uh, both 7th Fleet and 3rd Fleet uh, operations. Um, it will take time to produce them. Uh, we pursued a somewhat unique model in uh, how we've uh, moved towards initial operational capability. You're aware of uh, Freedom's deployment forward very early in, uh, in her development stage. Uh, it was an excellent opportunity for us to uh, work some of the bugs out, if you will, in an operational environment. Um, 
the uh, success that Fort Worth has had on, on her current cruise um, has been quite extraordinary for a ship that's that's that new, well beyond what we would expect from previous uh, experience of uh, a new class of ship that is uh, being fielded. Um, right now we're on a path to uh, uh, support rotational uh, deployments of four LCSs through, uh, through Singapore, um, but I'd be very open uh, to having more LCSs uh, here in the Pacific uh, supporting our operations. The utility of LCS is quite extraordinary, and our, our friends in, in the region uh, find it a very good fit uh, for their mission functions and tasks that they employ. It's sized right, it's got the right capability, um, it really is an excellent platform. Are you going to ask for more? Gonna, as you said, you have the plan right now is that four of them in Singapore right. over the next couple of years. Are you going to ask for, for more of them out in Singapore? I, I think that's that certainly is premature about uh, where we might rotate them through. Um, there is certainly a need for them. That's why we're purchasing uh, 52. Um, well, there'll be a dialogue internal to the Navy about how we distribute those. We're a global Navy. We have global responsibilities. Um, I think it's a great fit for the Mediterranean. I think it's a great fit for Africa. It's a great fit for the Middle East. And it's a great fit for the Pacific uh, uh, the Indian Ocean as well. Uh, so that's a process that we'll have to work through with the Chief of Naval Operations as to uh, where we might uh, place them. I'm highly confident it won't be a basing uh, type situation. It'll be a rotational uh, situation, a basing uh, context and the fact that we would, be, we would be establishing more bases, um, I think we would deploy them to places uh, that we already conduct operations from. Um, we've talked about Saber is another example of uh, the types of exercise that potentially uh, uh, could be enhanced with the legislation that is, is being considered uh, now. Um, the uh, uh, Japanese, I think, participated as observers in the last Talisman Saber two years ago, which I, I commanded. Uh, and I think their participation is uh, uh, more robust uh, this year. I think it's an example of uh, the uh, multilateral approach that I believe that we should be taking uh, in the region. Um, I commend Australians' leadership in uh, supporting that exercise. It was commanded once again by the 7th Fleet Commander, uh, Admiral Thomas, as the uh, Joint Task Force Commander with an Australian deputy. I should note that Admiral Floyd, the 3rd Fleet Commander, uh, was the maritime uh, component commander, once again demonstrating the combined power of the Pacific, uh, of the Pacific Fleet. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, depending on the legislation going forward that uh, Talisman Sabre would be a, an example of a, a fuller participation uh, by the Japanese Defense Forces uh, with exercises throughout the region, further increasing the uh, stability and transparency, I think and the shared interests and shared concerns of many of the countries in the region. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for your time. Uh, one of the uh, uh, singular events that I have enjoyed uh, most in, uh, in this short, quick tour uh, of the uh, Pacific have been these media roundtables. So someone, some of you have mentioned that uh, questions that I've received uh, in a meet, similar roundtable that I did in the Philippines I did a, a similar one in, uh, in Korea. Um, I think it's a great opportunity uh, to support the great work that you all do in ensuring that uh, combined opinions and various opinions um, are shared publicly in a form that, that people can read and understand and make informed decisions uh, on their own. 
it's also a mechanism by which I, I uh, gain a, a better understanding of what the concerns are in the regions through the questions that, uh, that you ask. I think clearly uh, South China Sea is on the minds of the people of the region. It's reflected in your questions. It's reflected in every dialogue that I've had with the leadership in the Philippines and in Korea and in, uh, and in Japan. And I can assure you that as the commander of the Pacific Fleet, that I'm focused on applying the resources that I have available uh, to me to follow the guidance that uh, I've been given by my government uh, to continue to work hard to increase the stability in the region in a multilateral approach. Uh, and I think uh, what I hear from uh, my friends in the region, this is exactly the approach that they're looking for uh, as well. Uh, so thank you once again uh, for your time. And I look forward to uh, hopefully in the near future uh, we might have a, another opportunity like this to uh, share our thoughts and allow me to answer some of your questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen.